Content warning. This episode contains discussions around the murder of two girls, physical abuse, violence against children, child sexual abuse materials, and animal cruelty. It also contains some profanity. If you or someone you know is experiencing domestic violence, please call the national hotline at 800 799-7233. On a previous episode of The Murder Sheet, we heard from Bart, Tony Klein's former stepson and Kegan Klein's half-brother. Bart described the violence he experienced growing up in a household led by Tony Klein. Now it's time to hear from Bart's younger sister, This woman is Kagan Klein's older half-sister. She once was Tony Klein's stepdaughter. We're going to call her Gwen in this episode. That's not her real name. She's coming forward because she has a story to share. It's a chilling story of the pain and anguish a man can inflict on his own family. This isn't the first time that we've heard about a stepdaughter or stepsister in this case. Court documents reveal that Kegan Klein established an account labeled Emily Ann. That account was linked to child sexual abuse materials and lewd, horrifying chats about underaged victims. That account also contained writings about how Emily Ann was Kegan's stepsister, and that she was having sex with his father. Emily Ann appears to have been a figment of the account creator's sick imagination. Gwen is not named Emily Ann, not even close. And she told us she was never sexually abused by Tony Klein. But the memories she shared with us were disturbing nonetheless. We agreed to keep Gwen anonymous because we want to protect her privacy. She wants to share her story, but she does not want people tracking her down. So while we get that it's tempting to sleuth as much as possible in the Delphi case, we ask all our listeners to please respect her wishes. Instead of using the audio recording from our talk with Gwen, we're going to read from a transcript of our interview with her. We've only lightly edited this in a few parts for clarity. Otherwise, it's the whole story in Gwen's own words as we heard them. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenley. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. We don't just rely on skimming the headlines. We dive into these cases to bring you in-depth coverage. We're the murder sheet, and this is The Delphi Murders. Who is Tony Klein? Part 2. The thing is with it, if I'm trying to be anonymous, the minute people hear my voice, they're going to know in my real life, because this is real life for us, they're going to find out. So I was hoping just to tell my side or answer your guys' questions and somehow stay anonymous. And then the people who are following all of this and everyone, those people in my real life will put it together, two and two, that this is Gwen. And then everyone else that's not immediate family can just have the information. I want to speak up. I want to tell people how Tony is, but I don't want to be the only one doing it. 
and then all my family hating me for speaking out. But then, the minute I found out my brother was doing it, I told my mom, I said, I'm doing it. We want you to feel empowered with this, and not like we're just pushing you. That's just what I'm hoping this will result to, is other people. If they've had encounters with Tony or Kagan under the Emily Ann account, or the Tony Shots or Anthony Shots or any of the other fake Instagram accounts, I'm hoping just with my brother and I coming forward, it opens up and encourages other people to come forward if they're terrified. I'm just hoping that's what gets out of this, and consequences are being served for Tony and Kagan. So, to go back to the beginning, tell us about how you knew Tony Klein, how he came into your life. My mom married him when, I'm not sure what age I was, but I was little. I had been probably two, I would assume, my age, and that's how he became in our life as my mom married him. I'm not sure how she met him. I don't know those details. What are your early memories of him? Living in the white Peru house, I had to have been four and him abusing us. He'd smile at you, normal, and then you would blink and he would be a totally different person. How would the abuse manifest itself? Was it physical? Yes, it was. I didn't know this until all this came out, and I found out that he had punched me in the face when I was four and gave me a black eye. And so I asked my mom about that today, and she said it was over a Tupperware party Tony's mother was having, and we wanted to go to it. My mom wanted to go to it, and she wanted to take me with her. And Tony did not like that. And he punched me in the face, gave me a black eye, and then beat my mom over that situation. Jesus. A four-year-old little girl. Yes, and actually, just something came over me yesterday. I found a picture of myself holding Kagan as a baby, and in that picture, I am actually healing from that black eye that he gave me. Oh my God. And that violence, that continued throughout your childhood, as I understand it? Yes. The incident with my brother in the toilet, I remember just sitting outside that bathroom with my hands over my ears, just trying to be as invisible as possible because I didn't want his rage to then come to me and he'd beat my mom that time in that moment when that toilet whole thing happened. And I guess that my mom was in the middle of actually cooking dinner and Tony didn't like what she was cooking. So he forced my mom's hands inside the oven and scalded her hands. And I remember police always coming to the house, but they would always just tell him. He would say, oh, I just didn't take my medicine and I'll make sure I take it. And they would just say, Tony, you can't be doing this shit. And pretty much just tell him to knock it off and they would leave. His medicine? Did he have some sort of condition? Bipolar. I always just knew he said he was bipolar and he needed to be on his bipolar medicines. But that was always just a ploy for being able to get away with, I guess, abusing us. Why do you think the police didn't take this really horrific abuse more seriously? Maybe child abuse is just so common. They aren't going to arrest someone every time they get a call out to the house. And not that I want to put any speculations out there, but maybe he had people in law enforcement that he could manipulate, or they just knew and just turned a blind eye to us. Do you know if Tony did have any friends in local law enforcement, and who they were if he did? I have no answer to that. I don't know. I I don't know. He could. He couldn't. I don't know because I had left and I didn't, I pretty much ran. I ran from here for as long as I could, just from everything I dealt with growing up. What was it like growing up in that sort of household with such fear and violence being a part of your life? Terrifying. You never knew. There were times that I could just huff wrong and he would beat the living shit out of me. Did teachers or people on the outside seem to have any sense that something was wrong? I would think so with some of the times the way we would go to school. And it affected my schoolwork. I I know people knew. I just don't think anyone knew how to stop it or help us in in a way. It almost sounds like he... I don't know. I'm so sorry that you and your family went through this. You mentioned he could smile and had this other side to his personality. Was that a calculated thing where that's what he put out to the world and then he was very abusive at home? Or did that violence spill outside? 
I guess I'm trying to get a sense of what kind of face he projected to the world. I remember this specific time. We had our neighbors over and we're having an outdoor dinner at his outdoor table and food was served, placed on the table. I had sat down at the head of the table in his chair, just as a joke, and he had asked me to get up out of his chair and I said, make me. And he flipped that whole entire table onto me, just in front of everyone. And everyone's like, are you kidding me, Tony? You can't do this. You cannot act like this. And people would just tell him, don't act like that, but then go minding their own business when everyone knew he was every day beating me and my mom and Bart. And Kagan never got a hand laid on him. Out of the three of you, your mom, Bart, and yourself, would he target any one of you? Or was it he was doing it to all of you pretty equally? My brother has his own memories about growing up. I would consider my mom and me getting the most out of it. My mom mainly, and then me because I'm a girl. I was a small child, and I couldn't really stand up for myself. And when I did, he knew he was more powerful than me, so he easily knew he could take me on if I looked wrong at him or stepped wrong towards them, anything. With your dad, did he know about this? How did he feel about this abuse that was going on? I would imagine that, I mean, he obviously didn't like it, and it actually got to a point when I turned 13, I told my mom I could not live with her any longer, and I could not live around Tony, and I had to leave. So I actually left my mom, and I went and lived with my dad the rest of my time until I was 18. And that then, I guess, when you grow up in such a traumatic household, you and your siblings get separated, And I never really remember having a relationship with Bart or my mom after leaving, other than the few weekends I would maybe go to my mom's for that weekend. If I may ask, are those relationships closer now that some time has passed? Or Yes, I speak to my mom every day and my brother. My older brother and I, Bart and I, have a great relationship. I'm so happy to hear that. I really am. This situation, living with Tony, growing up with Tony, just sounds like an abject nightmare. When we're talking with Bart, we're talking with you, that's what we're just getting, that this is a very, very violent person. He really is. He is a textbook sociopath. What else would he do that would give you that impression? We had ended up moving from Peru to Young America, the brown house. That's what we called it growing up. And not sure how old I was, but had to be probably 9 to 13 He was out in the backyard with a BB gun in his hand, and he looked at me and said, start running, I'm going to shoot you. And I said, no, you're not. And he said, I'm going to give you five seconds to get a head start. And he pumped it, and I took off running. He shot me. The BB went into my elbow, lodged itself in there, to where then my mother had to take me to the emergency room, and I had to get surgery on my elbow to get it dug out because it had been... The BB had shifted down into my elbow bone, and I had to tell them that he was shooting the trash cans, and it ricocheted and hit me in the elbow because I was standing too close. Not that there could be any reasonable answer, but why did he? Why? He's a psycho. He's probably got to have multiple personality disorder to where he can switch from, I'm Tony, NASCAR cool guy, into cars, but mess with me or catch me on a bad day. He's very unpredictable. Who knows what he would do to you if you caught him on a bad day? That is just terrifying. He would kill animals in front of me. He was digging a hole for a cat once, and the cat came back to life, and he, right in front of me, just started bashing it on the head to make sure it was dead. And that you're violent towards people and animals, so animals weren't even safe around him. Would he kill family pets? He did shoot a dog of ours. I'm not sure what the reason was for it, but I have had multiple people tell me. I don't have that memory, but I have people who said, yeah, you don't remember him shooting that dog, just going out there and shooting it? Jesus. Jesus. That is just... He would come home from work every day, come into the house, sit in his recliner, and make me take off his shoes and boots and socks. And in the mornings... He would make me put socks on him, his shoes on him, and tie his shoes. 
He always used to make me rub his back, put on WWE and lay on the floor. And I'd have to just sit there and just rub his back the whole show. And that was disgusting. Not in a sexual manner, but it's just, I don't know. It's creepy and it's like a controlling thing. Like you have to do what he says. Oh, yeah. And you do, unless you want to get beat up. My mom said, my mom told me that I mouth off one time and he went and got a bar of soap and made me eat it and asked me how I liked it. And I looked at him dead in the face and said, I love it. And he made me sit there and eat that whole entire bar of soap. I remember a night he came home when we lived in the Peru house and he was mad about something and and kicked us all out of the house, made us go sleep in the car in the driveway and then came out a few hours later told us to get out, and he started his truck and burned out to where then all the gravel just flung at us, and he just sped off. And my mom just said, go in the house and just go to bed. It seems like he went out of his way to just inflict pain on you. It sometimes felt like that's what it was. We were easy targets for him to release his anger on, and he viewed us weak because we couldn't stand up to him. And he knew the law wasn't going to step in because they never did in the past. And even if he did go to jail, he would be in there 24 hours and then get out the next day and then come home and beat the hell out of my mom for it. I remember one time he dragged her from doing laundry or something and into the bedroom and she's screaming and I hear him beating on her and me and my brother are banging on the doors and he flung open that door and said, if you knock on this door one more fucking time, I'm going to blow her head off. He cocked a gun. My mom's just lying there terrified. And we just went into our bedrooms because what do you do in someone? What do you do in that position at that young age? You you can't do anything. No. You're a kid. Did he ever express or indicate any sort of, I'm just going to say, perverted sexual stuff? Well, that's one thing. Tony has never laid a hand on me with. He's never, ever been sexual towards me. Because I don't think he would still be living if he did. And that's one thing, though. It's never been sexual. It's always been physical and mental and emotional. Understood. Understood. If not towards you, then I'm curious. Towards other young girls, would he ever make comments about that or any weird sex stuff just in general? Not in my remembrance. Because, like I said, when I was 13, I left. And I don't know how my mom and him got divorced. I don't know any of that. I wasn't there. So from what I remember, he never... He was creepy because I just knew him. I knew how evil he was. So I always just had a wall up towards him. Did I ever think that it was as dark as what it's become? No. Do I believe he's capable of anything? Absolutely. I wanted to pivot from Tony to talk about Kagan. And you mentioned having that picture of yourself with him as a baby. I guess, what can you tell us about Kagan? He was normal in the beginning, I guess, as you are as a baby, and normal up to elementary age. And then he just flipped. He just became really difficult. He didn't want to attend school. He wasn't able to pass grades due to not wanting to attend school. So then he got held back a couple of times. And yeah, I'm pretty sure he dropped out of 8th grade, ninth grade. Do you have any sense of what happened? I don't. Him and I didn't have a relationship at first, after I moved with my dad. Well, Kegan and I, I thought we were really close at one point. When I left my dad's, when I was just by myself, we would hang out and stuff. He was always so normal. But he would always say crazy stuff, like being a backup singer for this person being a backup singer for that person. He's always just had very outlandish stories to tell. So we've always just been like, don't believe anything that comes out of Kagan's mouth, pretty much. But otherwise, pretty normal. Like maybe he's exaggerating or he's lying about how cool his life is, but seems like a normal dude otherwise. Yeah. You mentioned Tony never laid a hand on him that you saw. Did you get a sense of what his relationship with Tony was like? He was the golden child. If Keggins ever experienced anything abusive or malicious from Tony, it's been in his adult life. It was never as a child. In one of the documents that we have, Keggins told a reporter 
that Tony hadn't contacted him for months and had cut him off after a raid at his house. Knowing their relationship, knowing what they're both like, what are your thoughts on that? I don't believe him. You think he's lying? Do you think they're still in touch? Oh, absolutely. I know Kagan and Tony are still communicating because no one else puts money on his books. But Kagan always has money on his books. So who else would be doing that? Because I know my mom hasn't sent him a dime. How do you know he still has money on his books? To communicate outside of the jail. Okay. Okay. What do you think he's trying to gain by lying about that? I don't know if he's trying to gain anything from lying about it. I assume he's just scared of being a snitch and about going to prison for something. And then being his dad that he has to probably snitch on, he's probably terrified of that. So you mentioned that one time that you were close with Kagan. Did you have a falling out prior to his arrest? No, I actually had a belief that he was in Vegas living for four years, and where I was at wasn't that far from there. So Kagan and I actually had a plan to meet up. I was going to drive over to Vegas and just stay with him for one day and then drive home. And that day came, and he ghosted me. And it makes sense why, because he wasn't even there to meet me. Approximately what year did he ghost you? 2018? 2017? What do you make of this whole ruse that he put together that he was living in Vegas? Fantasy land, I would assume. I don't know what's in Vegas that he always just went to Vegas, or I don't know what he did in Vegas if he ever really went. I just think that if you live a basement life, you've got to create a really good fake one, and then you can get yourself mixed up between your real life and your fake life. One thing that Kagan has said about his dad in some of the interviews that we read was that he's bad at technology or that he shares phones with Kagan. Yeah, I heard that. I wouldn't honestly put it past Tony not to know how to run social media. I can see Tony saying, I want to get in that, but you got to show me how to do it. But then I think that once he realized how to just simply do stuff, he's capable of logging on to things by himself and doing things. He's capable of logging onto things, apps, by himself and doing things. So I think he's conscious enough to know how to do certain things. But the Chrysler documents and all of that, yeah, I could see Tony not knowing how to do any of that. Ke Kagan might be doing it for him. Right, right. As far as you know, do they ever share phones or anything like that? That's just such an odd detail. What father and son share phones. Right. I don't know. How did you find out that Kagan had been arrested for the abuse materials? Girlfriend A. She called us and said, they just came in and got Kagan. And then the next day, we logged on to the Miami County or the My Case thing. And it was all there. And then everything. Just from that day on, it's been slowly more information, more information. How has this been for you and your family? I can only speak for myself. I can't speak on my mom's behalf or on my brother's behalf. I'm just enraged. I'm pissed off. I'm mad that Kagan blew me off. The last time we were supposed to have my mom's birthday party out here, he pulled some bullshit that he couldn't come because of his work, and I just let him all have it then, told him that it's bullshit, that he agrees to plans but then never shows up, and what the fuck is he doing that you can't leave and come over here for a couple of hours for mom's birthday? And then, bam, he's arrested. Arrested for all this. And then details and details. I just want to shake him and be like, what are you doing? Why? But I didn't do anything wrong. Kagan and Tony, they're their own people. It's unfortunate that he was my stepdad when I was little, but I have nothing to feel ashamed for. I'm here to help, to convict them if they need convicting, because there needs to be consequences to actions. And neither of them have ever had that growing up. This is Kagan's first giant consequence he has ever dealt with in his life. It sounds like Tony would just let him get away with anything back then. Yeah, absolutely. Have police reached out to you? Let's skip that one. Okay, no worries. I just don't want to get in trouble. I don't want... No, you're fine. I don't have anything to get in trouble for, but... You don't. You don't. Gwen, you're fine. You're totally fine. And we respect you and we respect the boundaries that you set. And you can just say pass, and we'll just move right on. So you don't have to. Yeah, they did. 
they came out here and contacted me, but it was right in the beginning. And they told me some stuff. And they just asked me then to keep my mouth shut and not say anything to anyone and just let it be invisible. But now that it's plastered all everywhere, I can't even get on the internet without seeing it. Yeah, they did reach out to me about Kagan, and I told them exactly what I knew. When did you become aware that there was a possible connection to the Delphi case? I'll skip that one. Okay, no worries. Outside of your discussions with the police, just from your own personal opinion, do you think that the bridge guy or the voice recording sounds like either Kagan or Tony? No, I do not. Interesting. Tony's voice, he has a very womanly voice. It's a very high-pitched tone. He has that man's voice, but it's very high-pitched, if that makes sense. He doesn't have a deep, dark man's voice. He has a high-pitched woman's voice with a man's tone underneath it. I don't know how to explain it. Tony sounds like he displayed all this really horrific behavior towards you and your family. Did he ever focus that energy on people outside the family, like stalking other people or anything like that? If he did... I would not have known about it. He was normal to neighbors. The neighbors liked him. He never really was mean to neighbors. To them, he was not mean, but to us, he didn't care that they were around. I've heard that he abused his ex-wife in public around people. That's absolutely, I mean, I would believe that. Right. And I wanted to get your thoughts now on the Emily Ann account that Kagan at least has been connected with. And it seems like police are wondering if more people were connected to it than just Kagan. What are your thoughts on that whole development? And as it's come out, did Kagan ever, did he seem very into social media or stuff like that? Yeah, he always seemed into knowing computers. Where he got Emily Ann's username, I don't know. I don't know where he got that or why. Well, he admitted why he got it. It was so little girls would feel safer to open up if they knew they were talking to another girl. Yeah. How was Kagan with girls? We talked about girlfriend A. He obviously had a girlfriend at some point, but how did he seem around girls? Awkward. It seemed like his age of interest never changed, even as he got older. It would always be those fresh out of high school girls, or she's about to graduate, or she just graduated, and I'm like, bro, why? Why? Is there anything we didn't ask you about regarding this whole thing? What should we all remember, I guess, when we're talking about this situation? I guess just the focus needs to stay on Tony and Kagan, and I guess just for anyone younger, just be aware of who you're really talking to. Make sure you know who you're talking to, internet safety, because normal people are sometimes not what you think. Right. People expect my mom to come out and have a statement, and she's not going to do that, which I can understand why, because she feels so much shame that she birthed Kagan, and this is what's resulted in his adult life. Yeah, but she also birthed you and Bart, and you guys seem great. Yeah, it goes up and down. When I first found out about why Kagan was arrested... I was disassociated from my body. I couldn't think a single thought to save myself because I just cannot understand why he would choose a path like he did when we weren't. Yeah, we were raised by his psycho dad who abused and beat the living shit out of us, but we weren't raised in a neglectful manner, which I guess we were neglected, but we always had food, I guess, and clothes on our back, even though the things were happening at home like they were. But as an adult, I'm not going to let any of this affect me in my life because I have my own family now. And maybe what I went through was for a reason, to help people. Maybe just through this. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out. I will say one thing, though, that I have in my notes that I... Two things, actually. When we lived in the brown house, Tony had a dirt bike. And at that time, loud noises scared me. And so when he would rev the dirt bike up, he would think it's so funny... He told me to run, and that he was going to run me over and start chasing me. And started chasing me. And the first thing I could think of was to get off the ground. So I started climbing this tree, and I got up too high, and got onto a bad branch, and the branch broke, and I fell from that tree onto a pile of bricks and broke my leg. Oh my god. And then at the gas station in Walton, I'm coming out, and Tony's walking in. He'd seen me, and he's like, oh hey, what's been going on? I'm like, nothing, just whatever, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I'm sorry for the way things were. 
do you need me to put some gas in your car or buy a pack of cigarettes? And I was like, no, I'm good. He's like, okay, well, see you around. And that was the last time I ever spoke with him. And that just goes to show how sick he is because he knew. He acknowledged how we grew up and what he did And he had apologized, so he thinks that just because he would apologize, it's all clean slate. But just cool, calm, casual, hey, what's going on? You need me to fill up your gas or buy you a pack of cigarettes? Not that I'm fearful for my life now. Not that I'm fearful for my life now that I'm coming out with saying all of this, because I just don't think he knows where I live. My mom's just scared that it's going to enrage him. But I'm an adult. If he shows up, then whatever happens but I don't expect him to. But that's in the back of my head because I know what he's capable of. And if he's capable of what is being said, which is with these girls, then who knows? Do you have tips on the murders of Libby German and Abigail Williams? Email abbyandlibbytip at c-a-c-o-s-h-r-f dot com or call the tip line at 765-822-3535. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenlee, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at mSheetPodcast or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.